What does God expect from me? How do I live a life of purpose? How will I impact the world? What on earth am I here for? There are over six billion people on earth, each searching for the true meaning of life. Why do so many people simply go through life without ever discovering the true purpose they were made for? Why do they leave this life without ever knowing why they really exist? Where will they find the answer to life's most important question? What on earth am I here for? Hi, I'm Tom Searcy. Welcome back to the spiritual journey we are calling, What on Earth Am I Here For? There are five purposes inside of this journey, and we are on week three. The first purpose that we learned is that God made you and that he loves you, and he wants you to love him back. The second purpose is that you're not alone. God made you to be a part of a family. We're belongers, a part of a larger family, a larger group, not just believers. Today we're going to learn that we were created to be like Christ. And more importantly for all of us, how does that work? Good morning, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that the most beautiful, loving, generous people in all of India are right here at Heartland Church. Aren't you convinced about that? God has, yes, you can give God a round of applause. God's really blessed us. And uh, while, while preparing today's uh, sermon, I was told that um, one, of, one of the best ways to make sure that you have a great sermon is to make sure, number one, you have a great opening, and number two, uh, to make sure that you have a great conclusion, and then to knit the opening and the conclusion as closely together as possible. That's, that's, that's what I was told. Put, put the opening and the conclusion as closely together as possible. So with that said, let's, let's stand for the benediction. Let's stand for, no, 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 no. You guys, <laughs> you guys are ready to go already? <laughs> okay, God bless you guys. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to share with us, we're, we're right in the middle of our series as we're discovering our, our calling, uh, what on earth we're here for. And we, we, we believe that the first calling or the first purpose in our life is to be loved. And our response back to God is worship, or that is to show him that we love him back. That's purpose or calling number one. Purpose or calling number two is to belong, to belong to something larger than ourselves, which is uh, what we call the body of Christ or body of believers or your small group, your, your close-knit family that helps to support you. Well, today we're going to talk about becoming that third call to become or to be like Christ. And so that's the third call. I'm going to read from Romans, the eighth chapter and the 20th verse. Now we can stand. Now we can stand for the reading of the word. You'll, you'll find it in your Bible, so turn your Bibles on or open your Bibles. You'll also find it on your green sheet. Romans 8 and 28. And it says, and we know, it's also our memory verse for today, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then here's the 29th verse that we haven't really emphasized, but we will today. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to become like his son, to become like Christ, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so in our effort to answer our calling, in our effort to walk in our purpose and to become like Christ. I want to talk today just very briefly from this subject, your calling is greater than your falling. Your calling is greater than your falling. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this awesome opportunity to be able to share your word. Lord, would you, would you remove my thoughts and my, my actions and my intentions and replace them with your thoughts and your actions and your intentions. Lord, would you use what you have to say in such a way that we could all understand, that we would be better when we leave than we were when we came. And now may the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name, if you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. God bless you. You may take your seats. 
again, our purposes as we are right in the middle of this series. And what an awesome series it is. We're right in the middle of discovering our calling. Number one, to be loved. You don't really have to do anything special. Just let God love you. But then our response is to love him back. Number two, to belong. And that's why we're emphasizing all series long to be plugged into a small group, to have a, a, a group to be able to support you. But today, to become like Christ, to become like Christ. And so I'm going to, as best as I can, uh, try and talk about why it's important, just for a, a minute or two, to talk about why it's important to become like Christ. And then I want to highlight three points of emphasis on how we can become like Christ. So first, why it's important to become like Christ, and then three points of emphasis on how uh, we can become like Christ. We're trying to become like Christ, we're trying to understand our calling, but I just wanna make sure I'm talking to the right folks. Um, how many of you believe that God has a calling on your life, there's a purpose, with the showing of your hands, if you'll just show me, there's a purpose that God has for you, there's some awesome plan of greatness that he's trying to establish in your life. Isn't God good that he has a plan for each of us? That we're not just here because of some coincidence or happenstance, God really wants to use us and the experiences that we've been through, the testimonies that we have. God wants to do something special in our lives, and that is good news. That's good news, that's good news. But have you ever, have you ever been trying to figure, figure that out and, uh, and been a little confused? Trying to figure out which direction do I go? It's kind of similar to if someone's trying to uh, explain to you how to get somewhere. You, you've ever had that, that situation where someone's trying to explain to you how to get somewhere and, and about 35 seconds into the conversation, you are absolutely convinced this person doesn't know where they're going or how to get you to where you're trying to go. Um, but they just keep going. They, they, you, you, you know the folks that just tell you, just, just keep going 13 blocks that way and, and then turn, turn left and then go about four more blocks south. Well, if I knew south and north and west, I wouldn't be asking for directions, right? And, and then they'll tell you, they'll give you markers like, you'll see a blue car on the left. Don't stop there, but just keep going. And then you'll see a, you'll see a person walking by in a red shirt and it's, and it's like, now you're more lost than you were before you even began. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? And so sometimes, Trying to discover our purpose is just like that. Sometimes, trying to, uh, trying to walk in our calling and understand what it's all about is just like that. And so, whether it's trying to figure out 15 steps or 10 steps or 12 steps or five signs or three points, sometimes it can become confusing. And so, for the next few minutes, I'm going to, as best I can, peel back all of the layers of confusion and make it as simple as possible to become like Christ. And I want you to know that your falling has nothing to do with the fact that you can still answer God's call. Somebody ought to shout amen to that. Amen. amen. So why, why should we become like Christ? Here's, here's what the Bible says according to Romans the seventh chapter. Uh, these are the words of Paul. Romans 7 and 21, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. The power, this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so here is Paul trying to figure out the same things that we try to figure out every day. Inside each of us, there is at least two of us. There is the spirit and the flesh. There is good and bad. And, and aren't you glad that this is the guilt-free zone where no one is trying to judge you or to condemn you or to make you feel uh, any less than we already feel sometimes when, when we feel like holding our head down? And, and Paul is in this situation, and he's saying, when I want to do right, I inevitably end up doing wrong. I inev inevitably make a mistake. I want to go right or turn left. I want to do good, I end up doing bad. When I have purposed in my life to be moral and ethical, for some reason, temptation is right there in front of me. Have you ever been in that situation before? And Paul, Paul, and I think we can relate a little bit, Paul is saying, um, 
there aren't any miraculous, deep theological 15-step programs I can take you through. Um, th there, isn't, there isn't any, any, any further moments of contemplation that you have to go through. You, all you have to do is understand one principle, and this is what makes it simple. Who, the King James Version says, will deliver me from the body of this death? Who is going to help me understand this struggle? Sometimes the enemy is the inner me. It's, it's the fight that's going on on the inside. Who is going to help me? And, and I know you are waiting for something deep, and Paul says the answer is Jesus Christ. That is good news. Somebody ought to shout amen. And so, and so if you have never understood before, or if you need to recommit or rededicate to the fact that Jesus is the answer for the world today, here is Paul emphasizing that point on why we should become like Christ. Jesus is the answer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father. No one gets to the kingdom of God. No one gets to heaven or paradise without going through me. Come on, somebody. Let's praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being that way. Thank you, Jesus, for being that way. And so um, that's why we should uh, become like Christ. Here are three just very quick points of emphasis on how we can become like Christ, how we can become like Christ. Emphasis number one, point of emphasis number one, we have to answer God's call. And in doing so, we've got to simplify things as much as possible and remove everything that prevents us from answering that call. We've got to do that as much as possible. Here is what the Bible says according to Hebrews, the 12th chapter in the first verse. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so I just want to share that the first point of emphasis is to answer God's call. Why don't you say that? Answer God's call. Yeah, we've all been in that situation where someone was calling a bill collector or someone... Uh, similar to that, and, and uh, we, saw, we saw the phone ringing, but, uh, or maybe it was someone who was going to take up too much time in your day, and, and your schedule was already appropriated, and you saw, you saw that person calling, and you didn't want to answer that call, or um, you may have uh, hit ignore, but you've got to be careful about hitting the ignore button on your cell phone because uh, it sends you automatically to voicemail and people will know that you have hit the ignore button. Um, if, you, if you've ever done that, just blink your eyes. Yep, yep, okay. Um, and so we have a responsibility to answer, we have a responsibility to answer God's call. We have a responsibility. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, I, I just, I don't think that I can answer God's call. You, you don't understand, Pastor Clear. I have, I have been through too much. I've done too many negative things. I've made too many mistakes. And uh, I want to share with you that your calling is greater than your falling. I want to share with you that that, that uh, the fact that you have fallen is no indication on whether you'll be able to get up. And so, I just want to, and emphasis number one, suggest answer God's call. Would you say that? Answer God's call. Okay, um, here's how I can illustrate that. Um, my wife, her birthday was in December, and, uh, and she asked me to buy her a doll. And uh, she told me what kind of dog she wanted, and um, it was a Yorkshire Terrier. And so sure enough, um, I wanted to be my wife's hero, and, uh, and I bought her a dog. Now, I didn't have enough time because her birthday was coming up to do the research and to, uh, and to figure out all of the things about um, being a pet owner or uh, about having a dog in your house. I didn't know anything about that. And so I just went out haphazardly and I found this dog. And, and so we've, we've got the dog and the dog is, uh, he's mixed breed. Um, 
and, and the dog is, he is uh, part behavioral problem and part hearing impairment. Um, yeah, that's him. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's missing some teeth and, um, and he can't, he, he refuses to bark. So once every three weeks or so, we hear him make some noise. For some, for some reason, he won't bark. He does not understand English. He doesn't understand English, and, uh, and he's, uh, he's definitely behaviorally challenged. And so I have the responsibility of taking the dog out. It's my wife's dog. Did I tell you all it was my wife's dog? <laughs> but I have the responsibility of taking the dog out to, uh, to relieve himself to use the restroom, and, and he's an inside dog, but you have to use the restroom outside. That's what we do uh, in a house. You, you have to use the restroom outside. And so it's cold outside, and uh, I, I, I really don't have the energy to uh, walk everywhere on a leash, and so I just let him go, little dog. I let him go, and I have to keep my eye on him. And, uh, and so one day he was out, and he went to uh, go and use the restroom, and uh, I stood there at the door waiting for him to come back, and uh, I saw that he he was finished doing what he had to do, his responsibilities. And, um, and so it was time for me to call him back into the house. And his name is Charleston. And I said, all right, Charleston, let's go. And uh, he did not answer the call. <laughs> and uh, so, so I had to call a little louder, you know, when people don't answer the first time or um, when uh, little Yorkshire Terriers don't answer the first time. You have to call a little louder. And so I said, come on, Charleston, let's go. He did not answer the second time. As a matter of fact, he actually looked at me and kept going. <laughs> so this creates a problem, but no worries, because I remembered how my wife is able to call him back in. And so I remember that she, um, she calls him little pet names. He's already a pet and already has a name, but she has other little pet names for him. And so she calls him Charleston Chew, but she, she doesn't just call him Charleston Chew. She, she use a, uses a higher pitch voice and she's, come on, Charleston Chew, come on, come on. And, and so now um, I've got to get this dog back and I've got to call him back in the house. And so I start calling him, come on, Charleston Chew, come on, come on. And I'm calling him to come into the house, but he is not responding to my call. And I remembered she uses other names like Snickerdoodle and Tinkerbell. And so here I am. Come on, Charleston Chew. Come on, Snickerdoodle. Come on, Tinkerbell. And he is not responding to the call. But no worries, because I remembered that my wife does a little dance when she's trying to get the dog to come in. She just does like this. Come on, Charleston Chew. And so I am going to get the dog to come in, and I start doing the dance. Come on, Charleston Chew. Come on. Come on, Snickerdoodle. And he is not answering the call. I'm out there about 10 minutes. My neighbors are watching me. I'm doing the Macarena Gangnam Style, the MC Hammer. I'm doing it all. This dog will not come in the house. And then here comes my wife, and all she says is, come on, boy. Come on and he comes running into the house. <laughs> Do me a favor. When God is calling, don't make him have to do a whole bunch to get your attention. God is calling each of us. We raised our hands and we said that God has a calling on our life. Do you, do you still believe that? And so it's our responsibility to answer the call. It's our responsibility. Let, let, let's try it one time. Just say hello, just say hello. One, two, three. Hello. God bless you. God bless you. Point of emphasis number two. Point of emphasis number one, answer the call. Point of emphasis number two is to encourage and support one another. It is our responsibility to uh, associate ourselves, surround ourselves in a group that can encourage us and support us as we discover our calling, as we try and figure out our purpose in life. And here's what the Bible says about this. Hebrews, the 10th chapter and the 24th verse. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching and all the more as you see the day approaching. And uh, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, um, I can't join a small group because uh, I have too many, too many troubling mistakes in my past, and as soon as I walk into a small group or as soon as I commit to a church, people are going to laugh at me. They're going to know my history. And, and can I just say again that, that your calling is greater than your falling? Can, can I say sometimes it takes a fall to really know where you truly stand? And so if God is calling you, he's able to look past your faults and to see your needs. Somebody ought to shout amen to that. Amen. 
And so we have a responsibility not to neglect assembling ourselves, not to um, choose not to be a part or to encourage one another. It is our responsibility because you don't know what people are going through. Every one of us is going through something, believe it or not, that's breaking news. Everybody is going through something. And so it's important to encourage one another. It's important to encourage one another. There was a, uh, there was a young man who went to the doctor one day and he was sitting there in the, uh, in the chair uh, in, the, uh, in the doctor's room and the doctor came in and, and uh, the doctor said, hey, how are you? And uh, he didn't say much and the doctor noticed that he was sad and uh, he said, hey, you know, you, you've got to cheer up. Uh, you, you don't look so well and uh, yeah, I don't know what's wrong, but we've got to get you to perk up a little bit. And uh, the doctor said, you know what? I know, I know the perfect remedy for you. Um, you, you ought to go see this clown that comes in town. Uh, the circus comes in and this clown comes, a special clown called Devro the Clown. You've got to go and see Devro. Devro has the ability to light up a room. He's always cheerful. He makes children smile. He, he makes older folks smile. You've got to go and see Devro. As a matter of fact, don't even worry about it. I'm going to pay for it myself. Just go downtown tonight and make sure you see Devro. He's going to turn your frown upside down. And, and the young man sat up a little bit in his chair and he said, Doc, I am Devro. Devro the clown. <laughs> you never really know what people are going through. And so it's our responsibility to encourage one another, to support one another. I'm just scaling back all of the difficult things that some people think Christianity is about and making it as simple as possible to become like Christ. How? First, We've got to understand that God is calling and we've got to answer the call. Second, we've got to surround ourselves with other believers and we've got to support and encourage them. As a matter of fact, why don't you take an opportunity to do that right now? Look at the person next to you. You've got, you've got five to 10 seconds and find something nice to say about the person next to you. Go ahead, take, take 10 seconds now. Just say something nice. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Did everybody have someone talk to them? If you didn't have anyone talk to you, go ahead and encourage yourself. Come on, let's give God a round of applause. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful? Don't you feel better when someone encourages you? I had to be a, a support system uh, for, the little, uh, for the little Yorkshire Terrier. I had to be a support system. Uh, I, was, I was going to the kitchen one day and it was my responsibility to, uh, to watch him and um, my wife has given me instructions not to leave him in the cage all day and so um, I, was going, I was going to the kitchen but he gets into things when he's on the ground so I put him on one of the stools because he, uh, <laughs> I'm the victim, I'm the victim. I put, I put him on one of the stools because he, he has a fear of heights along with his other challenges. And, uh, and so he's on the stool and I go in the kitchen and when I'm done in the kitchen, I see, as I'm coming out of the kitchen, I see that he is about to jump. And uh, he's looking, you know that moment where you're really looking and you're, you're really thinking what you're gonna do and, and I can't get to him, but I know that we've got a coffee table that's square and I don't want him to hit his head on this and, uh, because then we'll lose our dog. And so, um, and so what I do in, in slow motion like the movies, I start running and I put my hand out to, to, to buffer where he could hit his head on the coffee table, cause he's jumping now. And as he's jumping, I'm able to just stop him from killing himself <laughs> on the coffee table. And, um, and uh, what, a, what a great support I am to this dog. <laughs> and don't you know that God does the same thing for us? The Bible says that he's able to keep us from falling, but I, but I read, as much as I could, and I never saw where he will stop you from falling. That's up to you. That's up to you. And so here is the wonderful thing that God does with his infinite wisdom and his grace. What God does is, if you decide that you're going to fall, God, God takes his hand of protection and he keeps the fall from killing you. And so he won't stop you from falling, but he will keep the fall from, I'll say it one more time. He won't stop you from falling, but he will keep the fall from, isn't that good news? 
that's great news, and that's the kind of God that we serve, and that's what support is all about. All right, here's our last point of emphasis. Last point of emphasis is the third point, and it's just that we have to trust God every day for everything. We want to become more like Christ. We have a responsibility to trust God every day for everything. Here's what the Bible says, Philippians, the first chapter in the sixth verse, being confident of this, that he who hath begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that God has started something special in your life. It was started even before you were born. And if you're just willing to trust God enough as we become like Christ, if you're willing to just trust him enough, he's going to complete it. Do you believe that? Shout amen. amen. He's going to complete it. I just believe that God is going to complete it because this is one of his promises. He promised that he would complete it. And so you're going to get to a point where you want to give up. You're going to get to a point where you want to give in, throw in the towel. Um, here is my word of wisdom. Don't. Trust God with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Do you believe that? And so in our trusting of him, we've got to understand that he has begun this good work. And, uh, and, and I think that this is typified, the fact that we've got to trust him every day for everything. I think this is typified the most by this, uh, this, this young man who uh, used to walk the tightrope. Um, you all heard of the flying Walindas, this guy that walked across Niagara Falls, right? The flying Walinda family. Well, um, before, before the flying Walindas, there was this guy named Tightrope Walker. And uh, Tightrope Walker was a tightrope walker. And, um, and, and tightrope walker, he had the amazing ability to hitch his line to a skyscraper on one end and a skyscraper on the other end, and he could walk miraculously, it's a miracle to me, all the way across without a safety harness or without anyone catching him or anything of that nature. And so um, he just had this ability. And the greatest thing about tightrope walker is he could walk across this line, but he also had a wheelbarrow. I mean, he was really showing off, right? And so he's walking across this tightrope, and he also is pushing this wheelbarrow. He would do it from city to city to city until one day this promoter came up to him and said, hey, I know how we can make a lot of money. As a matter of fact, I'll give you $100,000 if you will walk across Niagara Falls. This is before they shut it down and then reopened it uh, for, uh, for Mr. Walinda to, to walk across. And so he said, well, I've never done that before, but I'll give it a shot. He said, okay, um, for $100,000, if you can walk from the Niagara Falls side all the way to the, Amer excuse me, the Canadian side, all the way to the American side, then, then I will give you the money if you can do it. He said, sure, I'll do it. And so the day came. There are crowds of folks out there, and sure enough, Tightrope Walker started walking from the Canadian side all the way to the American side, one foot after the other, and without a safety harness or any such thing, he got all the way to the end. Praise the Lord, everybody. And so he gets to the end, and Tightrope Walker goes up to the promoter, and the promoter's going crazy, and, and Tightrope Walker said, do you believe that I can do it? And the promoter says, of course I believe you can do it. Man, that was amazing what you just did. And Tightrope Walker said, no, do you really believe that I can do it? And, and the promoter said, of course I believe you can do it. We're all out here. We all just saw you, man. What you did was spectacular. And Tightrope Walker said, no, do you really, really believe that I can do it? And the promoter said, of course, man. Seeing is believing. And Tightrope Walker said, well, if you believe I can do it, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> if God's done amazing things in your life, he's just asking you to trust him one more time. Now, for some people, that's difficult. For some others, it's easy. But there is a universal truth in becoming more like Christ. It is simple. We have to just trust God. And so um, maybe you're never interested in walking a tightrope or being in a, uh, a wheelbarrow or anything of that such, but, uh, but here are some folks 
that are right here at Heartland that, that took that step uh, on their journey of discovering their calling to trust God with all their heart. Watch this. I just want to recommit myself to the Lord and rekindle the fire that I once had for him and be on fire for God again. I need to make some declarations and some changes. Um, and I'm tired of being half in and half out. I know it's important to them and to me that they know God is in my heart and that I love Jesus. To have my mom do this is, um, I can't express it in words. I was saved a long time ago, but I never just, just listening to Darren, you know, how important that outward expression of declaring yourself, declaring your life to God, it just became so apparent to me how I was missing that. It was really holding me back. And I just felt like I needed to, and felt like he was just, felt like God was speaking to me today. I want to meet him for my family, my wife. And I'm just ready to take that step and put my life in Christ. If all God wants you to do is to strive to become like him, and in doing so, trusting him with everything that you have, and if you fall or get off track, trust him to get you back on track. If that's all he wants you to do, then what's holding you back? If you're interested in becoming like Christ and trusting God, would you stand? Would you stand? For some of us, it's to become baptized or to be baptized. It's that first step in getting into God's spiritual wheelbarrow. For others, it's to recommit our lives, to rededicate our lives to pursuing him with a buoyancy and with zest. For others of us, it's surrounding ourselves with that, that uh, close-knit family of supporters and encouraging others. For others of us, it's just answering God's call, whatever God's calling you to do today. Regardless of that situation or those situations, I want to pray for you. Wherever you may be, I want to pray for you. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the ability to trust you and for some of us trust you again. Lord, we appreciate that you have, from the very beginning, looked 
past our faults and still said that there's an awesome call for us. You still have a plan for us. Thank you. Thank you for beginning a good work in us. Thank you for the promise to complete it. Lord, we're trusting that you finish everything that you start. And so today, would you be for each of us the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the author and the finisher. Lord, we pray these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.